Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox here, and we're talking about the course E222, Intelligent Systems 2, and uh, this is taught by me with help from Gregor von Masvesky, who was a research colleague of mine. Uh, this initial um, slide set describes the overall structure of the course. It's not an intellectual slide describing um, the top, the, in detail of the topics, it describes things like syllabus and policies and processes and things like that. Thank you very much. I hope you'll learn something from this course. Uh, one important feature of this course is we effectively do not use Canvas except when absolutely necessary. Um, and that's when we do some of the homeworks and grading are reported on Canvas because sort of that's the only secure place we can do it. However, we much prefer GitHub uh, for all um, many of the Canvas features, and we also prefer Piazza for um, communication. So we use GitHub and Piazza and not Kansas, not Canvas. Um, it's not surprising GitHub is better than Canvas. GitHub is designed by the professional software community uh, to store software and software-related artifacts like documentation. And if you know, a course like this is full of software and software-related uh, documentation. And GitHub is uh, collaborative, it is open, and <coughs> It, it has slightly strange features like using Markdown as the as the uh, text language, but uh, we can you'll be able to deal with that. Um, for this introductory course, which is for sophomores, uh, we will be relatively modest in how we explore clouds, and we will use VirtualBox and or Docker uh, when we look at clouds. Other things such as OpenStack and um, and Kubernetes, will, you can take some of our more advanced courses to, to cover that. Or you can do an independent study. Um, so we actually take all the material is stored in GitHub, but then it's automatically um, made into books or handbooks or whatever, handbooks or lecture notes and what have you. And um, we have, um, Many examples of this, including some background handbooks of, of other students' projects and things like that. And those are available. And um, you, they're very large, thousands of pages. And uh, you will, you, we will, you can see a link here for how to, how to look for them. And this, this is the E222 EPUB. But there will also be links to the um, one. Um, to the other courses, 516, 616, which uh, are supported with the same broad technology, but more advanced, and the various uh, supporting handbooks. And we use the so-called EPUB technology, which is sort of designed for the digital uh, world. And um, it's unfortunately true that the reading technology for EPUBs is not as advanced as maybe you might hope. You can find almost everything on the web, and that's just life. Uh, we also have access to some Gartner material. Gartner is a leading industry analyst, and they have some pretty interesting insights. There is a book from friends of ours by Ian Foster and Dennis Gannon, um, which is probably significantly more advanced than this class. But still, it's a very good book. In the material which we put together on GitHub, and it's all done as collaborative technologies. Um, um, and so you can actually contribute to this, these, public, these books and compendiums of material that we produce. And so you can actually contribute a whole chapter or improve an existing chapter. And you should just tell Gregor what you're doing so we know what's happening. And uh, here's where you'll find the handbook. And um, you can, your contribution will be documented. 
if you if you actually may do that. And of course, again, all of this is managed by GitHub. I should say that um, as you, if you're listening to this on a video, you will notice that we're making video recordings, but they're also given conventionally. And all the links, the handbook has the links to the recordings, which will typically be on YouTube, although in the past we've left some of them on Google Drive. But uh, and we, some material we have is also on Google Drive, but um, we have a split opinion between Google Drive and GitHub. Uh, um, GitHub is designed with versioning, with very sophisticated versioning, so it's good for, that's why it's used by the software community. But uh, Google Drive and the Atoji technologies like um, Google Slides and Google Docs and things, they are they in for certain important things like preparing slides or or sophisticated documents is uh, they're pretty important. And of course, Word and LaTeX, which uh, we also use, are the more LaTeX than Word, also uh, they're they're the most sophisticated word processing systems. Um, GitHub and Google Docs and um, have huge advantages in being nicely collaborative, and but they're Deliberately, that technology is less, they support a less sophisticated publication model. Okay, if you go to, uh, if you use GitHub to produce things, you should know some of our conventions. Um, so uh, we have a, we will, there will always be an index and a table of contents. Uh, the hyperlinks are embedded for these various things. And there are little boxes which have um, particular topics, notes, some warnings, and the exercises are also labeled. And you only do the exercises for all your sections. So some, some of the material is uh, across different sections or different courses. Um, so, and of course, some of the exercises are quite sophisticated, so be, be a little careful there. Still, we try, we, nothing is hidden, and so you can actually see what you might do if you become a more professional cloud engineer. This, this is the um, overall structure of the course. As you're saying, you're always invited to contribute. There are to-do lists in each of our documents, but um, the, we have the handbook, we have the class management, collaboration, scientific writing, because you, you're going to write projects which you should do professionally. We use almost all the programming in this class is Python, although the core technology is written for clouds, is written in Java and Scalar or C++. Um, in this particular class, we're focusing on what is a cloud, what is a service, and for services, a particularly important technology is called REST, which means a trivial service that beat up the more sophisticated so-called web services, which are very complex. And however, people found simplicity won over complexity, even though the complexity had some significant advantages. We have a discussion of AI, because the end result of this class is a project where well, you'll produce AI or machine learning capabilities implemented as a service running on a cloud. And of course, the handbook has the links to what we call theory here, which is just a discussion of the core technologies and core ideas, which will have both a PowerPoint or Google Slides and videos. And there are plenty of examples. And these supporting volumes discuss all the technologies in different sections. There are hundreds of technologies of relevance. So you look at the so-called Apache big data stack, which is all the software systems covered by Apache. There are many hundreds uh, of such technologies of relevance to clouds. And a key feature of cloud computing is the richness of the software model. And that the fact that the software model is largely open um, and uh, freely available, and anybody can contribute. It's a really different model from the past, and it's if you see it happened. Uh, it was it's when services, web services came along. They were all done in this model, 
Uh, then when clouds came along, all the more sophisticated things, programming environments and resource management, etc., was all effectively done in this model. Not all in Apache, but probably well over 50% in Apache. So here's the uh, syllabus. We uh, found out in last year when we offered this for the first time that I know you've done Python. You didn't seem to know it quite uh, in a sophisticated fashion to be able to use it for technical problems such as the machine learning and for cloud related problems such as building services. We will discuss how to develop a, what is a wet rest service and how to develop it using standard tools. Everything in this field has standards. And it's pretty important to know the standards because that allows you to make certain that your technology will run on Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Alibaba Clouds, as well, and as well as your virtual box installed on your laptop or your Docker container and things like that. Um, we will have an introduction to clouds with both a theory, which I will give, and practice, which Gregor will give. Uh, we will review whatever we need to know about artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to build an AI engine and run it as a web service. And uh, we will use um, Docker. Previous years we used Kubernetes, but we found that was too sophisticated. Sorry, and then we will have an introduction to what are called the programming environments of the cloud. It was originally Hadoop, then Spark. Uh, we will often use our own system, Twister 2, and we will discuss the theory and practice of those. And the final part, of which is most of the grade, is build a machine learning service on a cloud. So hopefully at the end of this class, you will um, know what a cloud is and uh, why it's important. Uh, in intelligent systems engineering. You'll get lots of hands-on example, lab experience with examples. You will need to know mathematics and science and engineering to build your projects. And you will also need to know how to use so-called software-defined systems. That's also known as DevOps, how you can use um, specification files and tools to automate the production of software systems. And you will have to work with other people. So your teamwork will be um, advanced. And you will have all the theoretical and practical knowledge of all this stuff over here. OK. Let's um, now get on to the, the how it's structured the course. There's sort of these three threads. They're talking together on Piazza. They're going to be writing papers. So that's the communication thread. There is the theory thread, which is the basic material, which are just formal slide sets. And these slide sets are summarized in the handbook, which points to the to the videos with some, and it's all divided up into relatively small modules. And you were doing programming and on cloud systems using Python. Here's just a couple of slides to explain why we're using clouds. So it's sort of interesting. In 2008, clouds didn't exist. And then Amazon had this brilliant idea of, of, of reusing some of their infrastructure uh, when it wasn't being used and offering it to the public as so called infrastructure as a service. And if you hear this plot from uh, what's called a, you know, if you go to the web, you can get all sorts of plots. This is, I think, consistent with the same plots you'll get from other reputable sources. And it points out that if you look at the so called cloud arena from 2015 to 26, it is and is expected to grow around 20% per year. If you look at the um, traditional, um, uh, um, approaches to computing, they're declining. And they're actually going to end up at around, um, here's the conventional thing, infrastructure. It's around half the total. 
and also not only that, sort of international, the staff is also declining because you no longer need as many in-house staff. Notice uh, the cloud actually consists of so-called public clouds and private clouds. Private clouds are obviously clusters running in, in, in private installations, which is often being done for security reasons, because you want maybe your most sensitive data, you do not wish to run on, cloud, on public clouds. Although as far as I know, that is possible to, to do. I don't believe there are serious cases where data, run, data running on public clouds has been uh, attacked and hacked. The hacking is always of email lists and things, and nothing much to do with the uh, use of public clouds. Because the reason is simple, public clouds probably have the best people running them, because they can afford to pay the best and have the best uh, system admins. And so they're probably the most uh, robust, secure places there are. Whereas pri your private cloud, you have to hire or whatever's available, or maybe people don't want to come to Timbuktu to run the private cloud there. It may not be the most attractive place to work. Okay, so this uh, points out the clouds are growing at 20% per year. The rest is declining slowly, 3%, with staff going down 7% per year. But here's another interesting point, although it's the if you look at how these things, these clouds, what are clouds? Clouds are basically technology to build a data center. And here there's data from Cisco, um, which I don't have the reference here, but if this slide comes from my cloud introduction, which does have the reference. And there are 600 and 338 in uh, uh, probably in 2017 and 628 by 2021. These are the giant um, data centers. And they, between them, will have something around 50 million servers. 50 million servers. And remember, there was zero just 10 years ago. And I pointed out they're about half the, the infrastructure. However, they run 94% of the work, at least in 2021. 6% is going to go run on traditional data centers. And the reason is. Why are you running clouds? It's because you're using virtual machines. If you use virtual machines, you can put multiple jobs on a single server. So the servers in clouds are being much more effectively used than the servers in traditional data centers. That's, of course, why traditional data centers are, are declining. And this is shown here that um, you have 3.5 um, times as many as much workload on a cloud than a traditional data center. And um, these are the actual instances running. And um, these are here, over here, we have the actual data centers going up to 628. And it's just um, the number of data centers is increasing 13% per year. As the, as the instances are going up 22% per year, that says we're getting more and more servers in each of our data centers. You can divide. Um, 50 million by 600, uh, or let's say it's 500 if it's now, and you will find there's probably an average of 100,000 servers in each of these hyperscale data centers. And these data centers are many football fields in, in, uh, in this in area. Um, and they're all, of course, placed in, not necessarily the place where power is cheapest, but the, t the combination of tax breaks and incentives and Quality workforce, there. That's where they're placed. They placing a new cloud data center is uh, something which is a, a prize for any location to get. This just is a review of what I did, and more and more in the order it will be presented. Uh, we will start with uh, preparing you, and uh, unless the the um, survey we do tells us we need to change this, we're going to go to. Python for technical computing, um, uh, the Linux shell, we'll do services and scientific writing. Services includes REST. Then we'll have this broad overview of clouds. And while we're looking at that, we're going to be doing the real world, virtual box, DevOps, with a technology called Cloud Mesh and Containers with Docker. As I said, we, we will not do Kubernetes in our current plans unless there's an overwhelming 
demand because we did Kubernetes last year and found it was challenging. And it really isn't necessary to follow this class, because this class is just doing a service. And what does Kubernetes do? It allows you to do lots of services or parallel services, because it supports multiple containers. If you just want to do a single service, you'll need one container, and Docker is sufficient. Then we'll do some discussion of what's on what you might call the high point of cloud computing, the programming environments. These are really made huge impact, the sophistication and power of these, with Spark and probably being the dominant one today. We have a little project locally called Twister 2, which um, actually started at the same time as Spark and inspired some of the Spark ideas. But um, we don't have quite the resources as Spark did. And then after we do those program environments, we'll tell you how to build services for machine learning. And we will also have various optional projects, such as using Raspberry Pi clusters, which is a fun. You can do all of this on Raspberry Pis as well as uh, giant uh, uh, Intel slash NVIDIA servers or Google TensorFlow servers, whatever you want to use. Um, so some policies, well, you should always think. Thinking is a, so our policy is students think. And you, that's not the same as copying and pasting. Copying and pasting means you don't think. So please read and think. And then you do, and you're allowed, of course, to copy material from the web as long as it's and as long as it's um, acknowledged. And so here we have this order: read, think, 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 do. And remember, everything is so fragile and screwed up and changing and things. So you better back up before you do anything that might uh, impact your your computer. Um, well, uh, just keep track of the calendar with the uh, midterm break and the other various constraints. Remember, really make certain you understand how to use Piazza. Please actually look at the handbooks and the supporting material and read it. Many of the students in the fact don't actually bother to read it. We hopefully we're trying to do a better job on the on the handbook this year to make it more easier to read. Previously, we actually joined all the classes together and it became a bit confusing. Uh, we will give you a homework identifier, that's so we can use GitHub, not Canvas, and we will not use the IUID, um, except in Canvas, which uh, um, is uh, not often used by us. We will have office hours, and remember TAs and AIs are the same. IU always uses the term associate instructor. The real world uses teaching assistant almost universally. And um, I would suggest that uh, you document what you do yourself in a notebook. And uh, .md is the markdown designator in GitHub. So you can put in GitHub what you're doing. And we follow completely the plagiarism rules of the university. And uh, we will. Um, Enforce that in the uh, in the reports you wrote, and we will discuss it in the lectures. Because you have to it's a part of this you'll learn is how to write a scientific paper. Um, all right, in the first uh, uh, assignment, you want to learn how to use GitHub. And um, then we're going to contribute. Hope you'll contribute to the lecture notes, and we the, the main part of the grade will be on a project which will be building in the simplest fashion an AI REST service, uh, and it will be built as a cloud service running in Docker. So everything is 30% um, assignments and homeworks and things. 60%. Project and 10% participation. And uh, possibly some of these remarks are not quite correct in the various handbooks, but we will tell us if we have any mistakes and we will correct them. There are actually no, no formal exams, um, but uh, the projects will, which will, we will set are meant to be done as though in high quality. And um, 
there will be assignment deliverable to the midterm and the final periods of the class. Here's just a comparison uh, between Piazza and Canvas. And, um, and Piazza just got a better model for communication. It encourages peer-to-peer -peer collaboration among students. It allows students and instructors to work together, uh, which gives us a single answer. Whereas Canvas just implies huge volumes of email between the students and the teacher. And uh, it's flaky technology. I, um, you know, Canvas will not ask me for a recommendation. It's, I, I think it's sort of trivial what's wrong. Canvas is trying to do everything, but that's the wrong thing to do in today's world. In today's world, you choose one thing, such as communication, and do it well. Or you choose one thing, like software uh, supporting versioned documents, which is what GitHub does. And you do that well. That's the key to today's world. Little, isolate important ideas and technologies and do them extremely well. And then you put together a toolkit and you'll take capability one from Piazza, capability two from GitHub and so on. And capability three from Docker and whatever and things like that. So that's an important principle of the world which Canvas does not follow. It's trying to be the complete solution and sells itself, I'm sure is that, but that's a mistake. It ends up being worse than almost everything in the other technologies because it's got too much to do. So Piazza, here's some lessons on Piazza. The instructor's guide to students. Please do not use email. When I get email, I have to look up on Piazza, see if it's been addressed, and it's really confusing to me. Uh, same with Gregor. So we, uh, if there's something desperate that's not working properly and there's somehow you don't think what we're doing is sufficient, you can send email, we will answer email. But in general, we want you to use Piazza and to collaborate on Piazza and peer, peer solutions. Because that's much nearer um, the way the real world works. Um, so here is um, an example of how to do good messages and um, about uh, how, to, how to install something. Um, and we will tell, give you hints as to what to do. Here is the first uh, week's assignment. Please put a bio on Piazza in the bio folder. Uh, that's after you've uh, activated the ads and registered in it. And please answer the survey. Then it will help us to uh, adapt the material. Just to say, we've learned a little from last year and changed the course, uh, dropping Kubernetes and uh, it's actually doing the Python, per, py, uh, the, sort of some of these support technologies, Python scientific writing first, not last. Um, but you know, we can still have made mistakes, and it may not be right what we're doing. It may not fit, and maybe this year's class is different from last year's class. And maybe you've learned more, and because the other classes are different. We will find this out when you uh, um, answer the survey. Thank you very much.